Great, thank you. Great, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining this really special workshop um, on how we can um, use our radical imagination to dismantle harmful systems. Um, really excited um, for our speaker today, um, Hector Flores, um, Hector Sanchez Flores, who is the executive director of the National Compadres Network. Um, we are all gonna be getting to know each other a little bit, um, including the speakers um, during the introductions. So before we um, start the introductions, we'd like to go over a little bit um, of the housekeeping items. So Mihai, wondering if you can um, transition us to the housekeeping slide. Great. All right. So again, thank you all so much for joining this workshop. Um, currently, um, the attendees are muted. Um, you can use the Whova chat um, feature to enter any questions, comments, interact with each other and the speakers, and that's on your far right, the chat function. Um, CPEN staff will also be monitoring the chat um, to make sure that we uplift any of your comments, responses, or questions. Um, and then if you need any technology help, you can go to the um, Zoom link on the event's homepage. You'll see the link here, or you can also call the phone number that's listed here as well. Or lastly, you can click on community and ask organizers anything on the left-hand sidebar navigation. Um, this session will be recorded and all recordings and slides will be made available after the conference. Um, and then most importantly, um, we would just like to say, you know, please show consideration and respect for other attendees. Um, this includes um, active listening, um, disagreement with civility, um, making space for sharing identities and life experience, practicing humility, and seeking warmth, not superiority. So even though we are all on this virtual platform, we still want to show up um, in a respectful and considerate way for one another. Um, and again, just a reminder, um, the chat function is your friend. So please um, feel free to use that as much as you like. And then um, Hector and myself will be checking with each other um, to make sure we're catching everything in the chat box um, during the facilitation. Nihei, could you switch to the slide that gives an overview of the um, conference or the workshop? Excuse me. Great. So um, this is the overview of the workshop today. So I just went over the technical overview. Um, we're going to first um, start with introductions or conocimiento and a dedication. Um, Third, we're gonna um, really talk about the role of racism in creating and sustaining trauma in the United States. Then we're gonna shift um, to talking about trauma and perpetuating systems. Um, and then really um, shift gears into conversation and how um, ourselves as part of the parallel process and also healing our systems. Um, and then last, um, we are gonna talk about what each of us can do and commit to both professionally and in our roles to and ourselves. So that's a, um, just a brief overview of what we're gonna do today. Um, and I am now going to pass it over to Hector for the introduction in conocimiento. Muy buenos días, uh, everybody. Good, good, good day. Good morning. We're approaching the midday where we would be met. Buenas tardes or good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really uh, honored that I was invited to share what little I have learned here uh, in the work and in living to hopefully inspire and maybe create a dialogue with one another uh, looking outside of this workshop in the future. But, but in the ways that I was uh, both at home home and professionally, I think there's an important thing that I would want to do. And I want to acknowledge Mije and Carolina for really helpful in preparing uh, for this workshop. They, they were 
excellent guides. I also want to do this in, in the best possible way um, because when we do this work to address the issues that surround white supremacy, racism, oppression, that we oftentimes overlook the really obvious things that are right in front of us. And I want to call out um, simply by, by recognizing that irrespective of where we're sitting right now, um, and for millennium, uh, people have existed in those spaces. And in many instances, those people have been erased uh, from our living space. And I want to acknowledge the spirit and energy that exists where we sit or where we stand. Uh, and if I can invite Mihe to share with everybody uh, the link uh, that leads you to a map that shows you the people that are probably in the spaces that we're sitting in. I'm calling today, I'm participating today from San Jose, California, and it is recognized that the Ohlone people were the people that lived and were caretakers of this land before it became Silicon Valley. And be, we, we get to enjoy the fruits of this beautiful space that they were such caretakers for. And so I, I want to acknowledge them and the spirit that they brought to the land and the care that they took for that. And, and they just didn't care for each other, you know, as, as people. They cared for the plants. They cared for the water. They cared for all the animals that existed here. And so they are the true example of stewards of, of land. And so in that link, hopefully you will be able to at some point uh, look and see who were the people in that area. And it's a beautiful map because many of the boundaries that exist there do not look like the, like the border boundaries that we live with today, whether they be county or city or state boundaries. And so I invite you to do that little bit of homework there and um, to, to reflect on those people. The second part that I was taught to do is to acknowledge our interconnection and, and interrelatedness by recognizing that we show up in spaces not simply as individuals, but as people who are connected. And in our best sense, we're connected in a healthy way. And in that way, I was taught that there are four directions that surround us, four cardinal directions that the direction of the West represents the feminine energy that we carry, each of us carries. And that with that uh, energy, we have the ability to um, incorporate the, the best and most positive aspects of that energy, that we can use it as a way to draw from within us the energy that we need in order to be complete individuals and to be living in harmony with the direction of the East, which hosts, which hosts the masculine energy that we all carry. And if we do it, if we live our lives in a balanced way, we can slide between the East and the West and use the best of those spirit and energies that strengthen the relationships we have with the people that we say we care about and that we love. And the direction of the North is the direction of the elders, the direction of the ancestors. And I invite them always to come and guide us in a good way so that we remember the sacrifices that we made. And we'll be addressing some of those sacrifices in the workshop and that we carry them. We carry them uh, not in, in the sense of, of, of you know, an abstract way, but every day uh, we acknowledge them and the role that they had to guide us. And we become better at living today because of the history and the learned things of those ancestors. And finally, the direction of the South, which is a direction of the children to come and the children, the joyful spirit, and hopefully we'll be able to br bring that in as well. And I think it's important to acknowledge the role that children have, whether they, they live with us or they're attached to us or they come to us through family, that that's why we do this work, is that if we do our work well, children will inherit more blessings and fewer struggles. And that's really the goal of my work at the National Compadres Network. And I want to just touch on that a little bit. We're a training and capacity building organization that believes that within the collective wisdom of all peoples lies uh, what we need to live in a harmonious and better way. Now, there's some things that we can learn along the way to be culturally rooted and healing centered in our work. And we will always try to contribute and support organizations and individuals that want to go and do that work. So. That's, um, that's, that's the preamble to the workshop. I'm gonna invite you at this point 
uh, and now I'm going to introduce myself. And I would want to invite you to think about how you would introduce yourself. My family comes from a small town in Jalisco, in Mexico, in the area of Mexico that is known for the Cora people and the Wiradica people. We, we refer to the Wiradica as Huichol. Uh, my family is in that small town. That's where my grandmother on both sides, Maria de la Luz Orozco and Andrea Valdez de Sanchez, Andrea Valdez Jara de Sanchez, uh, and my grandfather, Lifonso Flores Enrique and Guadalupe Sanchez were. And when I think about how I was asked to introduce myself in that small town, when I would be there, with my family, they would not ask me, what is your name? They would ask me, who do you belong to? And then I would respond, my name is Hector Sanchez Flores Valdez Orozco. And in that brief introduction that a little boy was taught, uh, they knew exactly who I belonged to. And with that came some expectations. I come from a family um, who, you know, is a huge family. And oftentimes we want to highlight all the beautiful things that our families carry. And we don't wish to share sometimes some of the trauma and pain that we also carry from our families. And so I can say that because I come from the family and I know the family from which I come from, that everything that happens in communities and families that we work with happened in my family too. And that gives me the ability to understand where medicine comes from, that we can begin to address and grow and convert into medicine. A, I want to say that I, I, I don't show up just to talk, but I really want to dedicate the time that I have here to some greater purpose outside of myself. And so on Saturday of this, uh, uh, on Saturday of this, of this week would be my father's birthday. My father has been passed for nearly 26 years. And he um, was, uh, I oftentimes speak about him and people think of him like, they say, oh, Hector thinks his father was perfect. And no, my father was a, a man with many dimensions and he had many relationships. And I'm sure if you talk to my mother or his brothers and sisters, they would show you all other kinds of dimensions about my father. But what I oftentimes say is that uh, he may have been an imperfect man, but he was a perfect father for me. So he was able to guide and support me in wonderful ways. A, a man who had a third grade education and taught me all the things that I probably use mostly, most day to day in my life. How to build deep and fruitful things with other people, how to live in a respectful way with other peoples and the greater good and try to contribute to a space that is better when you leave it than when you arrive. And so that's who I dedicate my time to today that we're gonna be here. And we're gonna take a brief moment and I'm gonna invite everybody to reflect to take a few, I'm gonna take four breaths. And if you have the ability, put your feet directly on the ground, settle and take one deep breath. Release. That one's, that one's for the people that are calling on your attention today. That even though you're here on this workshop, they're calling your attention. One more deep breath. Release. Those are the people that you want to gain the attention of. Not the work people, but the people that you say you love. May you by the day have created time for that. One more breath. Release. That one is for all the people that fed your spirit throughout your life that maybe taught you a little bit more about yourself than you understood and that you came to a deeper understanding of your purpose in life by knowing them. Now, truly the last breath. That one's dedicated to all the little people, the youngsters that are watching you when you're not watching them. And they're looking for ways of being in this world that is better than maybe sometimes we, we say it should be. So let us be mindful of 
you know, that we are reflections of, of a higher ideal that those children would be able to live just because they're not listening to the words we say, but watching what we do. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna pause for about 30 seconds. And I would like for all of you to think right now about who you dedicate the time in this workshop to. The individual and maybe one or two lessons that you carry because of them. And that's why you dedicate your time here. So we're gonna pause for about 30 seconds and I'm gonna invite you to put their names in the chat and then maybe one thing that they had really, that you associate with them really favorably that you feel comfortable sharing with everybody here. So I'm gonna start now. All right, I don't know if, if we can see what other people may have shared. Uh, oh, here we go. All right. It's not as important if you don't wanna put it in the chat is that you carry it in your heart uh, so that you understand why you're here. I wanna share that um, the, th the reason why I do that is that along the way of my life, somehow or other, my family was disconnected from its, uh, in its, it's an indigenous, uh, it's our indigenous roots. And along that process of being disconnected, we incorporated and kept certain aspects of it and other parts fell by the wayside. And as I mat matured in growth, I began to rediscover through conversations of family about how that process happened. And some of it didn't come from a very good place. And some of it came from a very uh, a belief that this is the way things needed to change. And so I, I'm very grateful for the candid conversations that I was able to have both with my grandfather and grandmother. And then as their life was coming to an end, they began to reshare some things that maybe would have been helpful to me to learn along the way as I was maturing and growing. I wanna say that I also, you know, when I attended universities, that there was an important part of me where that was sharing with my, my grandmother who never sat a day in a, in a formal school setting. I met my grandmother when she was about 85 years old and she lived to be 102 years old. And in that process, I, I began to discover the wisdom that comes from living a long life and being very, very rooted and I'm so grateful that at this point in time, I can marry and live my full truth sense of who I am completely and incorporate those practices that root my family and offer strength. So with that, you know, I, it's related to why it is that this work is really important, is that each of us carries a way to, to heal and to center, and that oftentimes we overlook them when we're in these spaces of professional development or professional learning. And the goals of being authentic to ourselves and the work that we do is how is it that we begin to show up in our authentic way, in our complete authentic way and make room for all aspects of it. Part of it comes from the role of racism and white supremacy that says when people came from other places, um, there was, a, a, there was a, a dehumanization process and a devaluing process. And we, although we're experiencing that from the outside in, we oftentimes experience it slightly different. The intent for coming here was the conquest for land and treasure. But when they arrived in a place, there were people here already 
there were people here, there were civilizations on this continent. And yet there were ways that, was, uh, that were designed to overthrow and subjugate those people. And so we come from different forms of subjugation. In some places it was colonial settlers that came in and just took land, took land from people and took it in a way that was quote unquote legal through trees that were never honored. And in that process of conquest and colonialism, there was an erasure of identities that oftentimes lives to this day in many of the spirits and hearts of people. There's the whole concept of slavery where people were brought to the United States and subjugated that now we look upon in a historic way and we oftentimes do not want to address the honest uh, impact of that that happens intergenerationally and lives today. There is a concept of saying that, you know, what is done in the past is done in the past. If you are connected to people, whether they be indigenous or of African ancestry, we understand the impact that was created through systematic ways of separating people and taking them away from who they were and creating other ways of subjugation that maybe does not look the same as slavery, but we know mass incarceration, the lack of investments in communities, the lack of investment in our health and well-being that lives today. Finally, the other one that I think is, is very evident to, for us today is the process of immigration, where at one time we invited people, and I won't say that we welcomed people. The United States is not known for being a welcoming space, but we invited or people came to this country and then we created seclusion. Uh, we, made, we, were, we were looking for labor, uh, and we created a transactional nature of this relationship between immigrants and the United States. And as a result of that, when we have, we live in a transactional nature where we want you for the strength, for example, my father, the strength of his arms and his back, what happens when his arms and his back are no longer as strong as they were when he was a young man? These are the things that we struggle with to this day when we invite people to, to be with us and we must acknowledge the fullness of what it took for Hector, for me to be here today. You know, the sacrifices that my great grandparents made, grandparents made, parents made, that allow me to sit here and act like I know something that is worth sharing. I honor that and I hope that you get a chance to honor that. And the benefit of having and learning to have these conversations is you begin to meet other people who are rooted in the same way and you hear their stories, you hear their journey, and you grow in deep appreciation for all the sacrifices that were made for them to be with you. And you grow in a deeper appreciation of the sacrifices that were made. And when you gather in that kind of joy, many more things are possible to do. And so, that's really important. But in addition to the, the structural things that happen, we carry some things internally within us that I think are really important to, to acknowledge is that we sometimes learn about those systems that oppress, that are made in structural ways, and how is it that we contribute sometimes without, if we don't think critically to those, to sustaining those structures. And so what are the mes messages that we receive of others? of the othering process, where we don't see one another as brothers and sisters, as tios and tias, as aunties and uncles, as babas and grandmas, right? What is it that we learn about others that we need to begin to actively deconstruct and rebuild within us so that the next generation no longer struggles from those kinds of separating activities? What do we learn about gender? How is it that we are in relationship with others that are different than how we identify in our gender? What are the messages that we have learned that have reinforced harmful patriarch, patriarchal practices? What is it that we have to begin to discuss within us so that we can show up complete and whole in that process? That is homework that we have that, well, let me put it this way. This is homework that I carry on a daily basis, that I happen to work with people that remind me and question whether or not my decision 
is sound based on openness, inclusion, and coming together? Or is it that I'm trying to perpetuate something that I learned in my Western ways and education in the process? What do we know about other people and their full identity and complete identities? Do we learn to be ourselves in a deep way so that when other people show up in their complete sense of who they are, we can appreciate, care, and love them up and we can come together in that and not sense in the sense of traumatizing and, and not being able to see those things. And then the final thing that I wanna point out is education. How would it feel if my grandmother was listening to this? A woman who did not ever sit in a formal classroom in her entire life, would she recognize the words? Would she recognize the feelings? Would she recognize that her grandson was had a noble purpose in having this conversation and sharing? Or do I only view people that carry the formal education from the Western way? And that's where I put my value. Along all those dimensions that I shared, education, identity, gender, and, and racial identities, these are things that I personally work on on a daily basis. When I read new things, I filter them through how does this affect my brothers and sisters? If it works for me, who else may it work for? And who else is not included in this process of thinking and sharing? And so if we walk away today thinking like, oh, well, Hector really has figured some of this out, very little. It's an ongoing basis. And I have to be very candid. It's I'm, un I'm having to undo things that I learned and integrated into who I was before I was aware I was even doing that. And the example that I like to share, because I think for me was the most, the most poignant one to really deconstruct in my mind, was being a boy growing up between Mexico and the United States in the late 60s and early 70s, and even through the 80s, the way that homophobic attitudes were embedded in our spirit without us ever questioning and thinking about. And so before I thought I was learning those things, they were being infused in who I was. And when I reflect back now on some of the things that were shared and taught to me, I shudder in embarrassment. But I am dedicated to deconstructing that so that has no place in my life and that I recognize it when it emerges so that my children will never hear those missed messages coming from their father. And so that my hope is the next generation moves that line a lot further along. And I oftentimes reflect on those people who were trying to teach me that. And I ask why. And it is oftentimes because they, those sentiments were also shared with them. And it has been passed down from generation to generation. And it's fine time that we do the hard work to recognize that. But I could have examples like that that relate to gender identity, that um, sexual identities, all of those things mean that this muscle is a muscle that must be worked at on a daily basis and we can't really leave it to happenstance. Now, the healing part of this is um, really coming together with other people who are doing this work. And so I can sit here and we can dwell on on those things that I consider traumatic experiences in my life. And there have been many as a man of color. Uh, if you're a woman of color, it's probably exponentially uh, more oppressive and the traumas are probably as great. Or if you're undocumented and you're in this country, the, the trauma that you experienced is probably on a daily basis. But we look at how systems can support that and so oftentimes as professionals or people representing professional organizations, we'll look to, well, there's mental health services that are available. There's some kind of community-based organizations service that is funded by the county or the state and says, that we, these are the services we want to provide. And I think they're really important to, to offer those services. But when you become culturally rooted in understanding a community, you begin to understand that that community and those families and those individuals they carry something within them that offers them great resilience 
and offers us an opportunity to build from so that they could be who they wanna be. They can access the services that they wish and also access the traditions and values that they carry that have helped them along the way. And it is that last part that I think that we oftentimes, we, we cut short. We don't engage in the conversation with communities to understand from them, how is it that they are still here? How is it that our brothers and sisters from that represent the African ancestry community, what kind of sacrifices what kind of courage, what kind of resilience have they inherited to be here today? And instead of looking from a deficit perspective, how would our programs look differently if we acknowledged and began from that point and moved forward? How would it look like if you thought, Hector possesses something of value to both learn from you and share with you. How would those services look indifferently? And some of the people that, it, that, that tell us the real deep work, they remind us that that history of trauma, those realities that have happened, they live within us, physically live within us. And so what is that we, what are the practices that we can do to acknowledge that. And some people would say to move beyond that. But I would say to live with it from a medicine perspective. That the sacrifices that my family and my community has made based on the traumas that they experienced has offered me an understanding that I call medicine. That if I want to grow, those experiences inform me so that I can begin to address them in a deeper way. And for me, they're rooted in indigenous practices, in those practices of sitting with one another, sharing with each other, and learning from me without me trying to solve your problems. And more importantly, maybe uh, just receiving a reflection of support and caring from others in that place so that it roots that connection. So when there's opportunities to share strategic things, it lands really well between my ears and lands really well in my heart. And those are really cr critical things that I have learned from my indigenous brothers and sisters that I have sat with because they do this from a, from a perspective of growing and sacrificing for one another in a way that sometimes uh, I have to incorporate more fully and practice in a more robust way. And the pandemic has interrupted a lot of that, but we've been trying to do that in a virtual way. Many of us come from reflective practices that incorporate sharing. And some people do it through formal ceremonies. Some people do it through religious practices. And maybe those traditions have been passed down generation after generation, but oftentimes it's never introduced in the way that we do our work. And so I think it's really, really important for us to, to look at those practices and find out how is it that we can um, utilize what those practices offer us without it being an imposition on others. Then we just become part of that oppressive nature that my way is the way that everybody should do it. And it's not an invitation to share and grow. I want to, um, I've been speaking for a long time and um, I want to acknowledge one question of, of that Tiffany Nguyen um, asked, which is how do you heal from lineage trauma and how to lead with love? Whew. That's a great question. Um, when I think back and, I, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to share with you um, the way I have done it. So in the region of Mexico, when people from the other continent arrived, only men came on those ships. If we think about people that come to, to, to do conquest on a land and only men arrive, 
one can begin to imagine the traumas that come from that. What were the actions, the practices that were perpetuated against men who fought? What were the actions that were taken against women who perpetuated and fought? And how, what did it take for the people to survive, to survive? What were the compromises that they had to make to live a new day? And so when I think back now of the origins of that moment, my prayer becomes, what did my ancestors do? What were the sacrifices that they made that allows me to breathe today? And I begin to live in a place of gratefulness without fully understanding the sacrifices that they made so that I can breathe today and contribute to the lives of others. So when I reflect back on that journey that I carry, right, that is embedded in my DNA because of the way I look, I am a product of that moment. Many of us in this continent are products of similar types of experiences, maybe dissimilar, but couched within the same power struggle of oppression and hierarchy, enslavement and conquest. And when I think about even brothers and sisters that come from other lands, I think about their journey and the courage that it takes to travel thousands of miles to places where we don't know the language, we don't recognize the cultural traditions, and we're just trying to sustain ourselves in who we are. And so when I think about that in that way, I begin to uncover medicine that I did not know I carry. And how is it that I convert that medicine of resilience into action to making this society in a better place? Now, I can do it from a really negative perspective and an angry perspective, but I choose to activate a sense of love. And it's not a word that we use in work very much, right? Because don't have any classes. I never took a class in college that said, how do you bring love to the profession that you're going to choose to do? How is it that you bring your grandmother's teaching and your grandfather's teachings in the role of the work that you want to do? So I carry a privilege that I get to do that in my professional life and choose to activate the love and love the people that I'm around and appreciate the journey that they had to get to where they are and be willing to listen and reflect back to them, love and acceptance so that we live to breathe a new day and build from that relationship. So Tiffany, I don't know if that answered that question the way you wanted to do it, but that's the answer that I, that I came with. And, and so the question that I have for many of us now is, so, so in, in, the, in the Nahuatl indigenous tradition, there's a, there's a term called olin or movement, movimiento. You, freq you, you frequently hear that. And it, I use that because my, my grandfather was a man who worked with his arms and, his, and, and, and was a farmer and a rancher. And so everything that he did could be manifested in something physical. If he planted corn, the corn came up. If you didn't plant corn, the land lay fallow, right? And so all of the sudden, you know, when he would meet his grandsons who were going and attending colleges, we had nothing to show that was a product of our labor. And so he would say, mijo, ¿qué están haciendo? Mijo, son, he would say, son, what are you doing? And we would explain to them the things we were doing, but he couldn't see the product of what we did, right? 
And so we would go through these mental gyrations of trying to do this. And so to this day, I still live with, what do you do, Hector? What do you do? And now I have an answer if I could, if he was still alive today. My answer to him was like, I'm trying to give life to the things that you have taught me. How it is to construct a community and family that says we're in this together. And I do that through promoting the, the cultural traditions that I carry, that we carry collectively, that we could carry universally as a way to then begin to activate the healing elements that we carry so that we can be full, complete, and heal in the process. So I'm gonna invite you to think about right now, because some of you may come from very different roles and have very different responsibilities, but what it is that you can do that would be able to give life to this journey of understanding, growing together and fighting, really struggling to make our society, our community, our nation, a place that reflects all of us that are here today. And so I don't know um, if we have a way to activate, if people can raise their hand to, to share, uh, but I would like to hear from people yeah. about their reflection on what is it that they would be able to do. And at the end, I'm gonna ask you the, 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 the closing question is, what is it that you commit to do that creates the movement? And Hector, this is Carolina here. Um, folks can raise their hand using the um, interface on your screen by clicking on participants, which is in the Zoom, the, the Zoom interface within Whova. I know it's a little complicated, but if you click on participants and on your right hand screen, you should see several icons with different colors and there's an orange icon that says raise hand. So you can raise your hand and then we'll unmute you so you can share with us um, your thoughts and reflections on that question. What we'll do now is give folks a minute to think about it. Um, Stephanie has dropped the question in the chat box as well for the visual learners. And the question is, please share your own reflections. What is it that you commit to, to doing that creates this movement? So you can go ahead and think about that and then um, click on the orange icon to raise your hand and um, get to know Hector a little bit and share with the group. If you don't share, you're gonna to have to listen to me more. And I think there's a lot to be learned from some of the people that are in this workshop. Joanna, you're unmuted. So Oh, okay. Uh, um, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay, sorry. I have a lot of different interfaces open right now. <laughs> it's a little confusing. Um, I was just uh, going to say that I, I think that as, uh, as a white person, um, a lot of my job and my commitment is just to listen, to just listen really deeply um, and to know that I have, that I, understand and that I haven't, um, you know, I've been paying as good attention as I could have and, um, and just to really, really listen with my whole heart to people's stories about what's true for them. Um, so that's just, I guess, what I wanted to say. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much.
I will give you, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna invite people that even if, if as I'm sharing, uh, if something comes to your heart and spirit or your mind and you wanna share, please raise your hands and we'll pause and do this. I, I wanna share with you how I came to do what I do and how it's very different than the journey that I had anticipated. I, I, when I went to college, I never thought I was gonna be the executive director of a nonprofit organization. Never thought I would work in the community the way I did. I chose to change direction uh, and not go to law school. And I began to work in a community in Northern California, working with young men that were becoming fathers at a very young age. And nobody thought I was gonna stick with that. And then I got attached to somebody else and I married a wonderful woman, her name is Lucy. And we moved to Santa Barbara where she was gonna continue her education. And I was working in the community there. And I met a man by the name of Jerry Theo. And in that work that I was trying to do in that community, I was trying to perpetuate what the systems wanted done in the community. The juvenile justice system and juvenile probation office said, this is what we want for the young men that are system impacted. And really that we're impacting. This is what we want for the parents. This is the things that the parents need to know in order to be better parents to these young people. And mental health services was trying to say, these families need support and they need to come in once a week for 50 minute hours, 50 minute hours and talk with us so that we can help them uh, with the issues that they confront. And I was part of that at a very young age in my career. And one day I attended a presentation where Maestro Jerry Theo was sharing. And he was sharing about a different way to be with community and work with community. And what I discovered was, as I was sitting there, I oftentimes, when I was working with the community, I would see reflections of my mother and my father in the adults and the parents that I was working with. And what I was doing, I don't think my father would have ever participated in. And I'm not sure if my mother would have participated in it, although she would have been probably the one that would give it a chance a little bit more. But when I heard Maestro Teo speak, it was the first time that I discovered that if my father had been sitting right next to me, he would have understood everything that that maestro was sharing. He would have understood the goals of what he was trying to do. And we, he would have seen what he could contribute to participating in achieving those goals. And that was a moment that changed my professional trajectory in the sense that then I began to look at all communities in that same way. What is it that we can do to bring you into the, so the creation of solutions that many times systems are creating that you're having to live with? And that has been what I have now dedicated my efforts to being, you know, dismantling that system of oppression that has existed since uh, the other people showed up on this continent and how it manifests and lives with us today. And what is it that we can do that it comes from an organic place that teaches us that the, the vision of what we're trying to create may not exist the way systems wanna create it for us, right? We need systems involved, but we don't want them to be the architects of what needs to happen next. We want it to be done from interconnection with the community that is most impacted and how is it that we then lift what they carry in the best possible way? And if you travel across the country and you meet people that have been living uh, with the systems that exist, they have incredible ideas of what needs to be done. The redistribution of resources that go from dismantling punitive states, whether they be policing or carceral, to also saying, you know, we, we also need mental health services. But in addition to the mental health services that are being extended and offered, we have ways of supporting one another too. And wouldn't it be wonderful for those, those more um, community rooted ways to receive the support that they need? Maybe we wouldn't be talking about uh, language uh, translation because they come in the languages that my mother and father spoke when they first came to this country. They would seem more organic. And so these are the things that I, that I think are very important. So today now I sit here as a child of immigrants, right? Who has a child who has two children, right? And so how is it now that I pass on some of those most valuable traditions that my family had to create healthy interconnection to the next generation? 
right? How is it that I create and raise uh, children who are culturally rooted in who we are as a people so that they would be able to appreciate the cultural, culturally rooted traditions of other people, you know, that comes from that point of strength, right? So there's many layers of us being able to do this. And Joanne talks about it from an ally perspective, from a listening perspective. And that's really important. And it's also incredibly valuable that as that our relationships deepen, we begin to also learn from Joanne. Just as I shared some of the things that I have to dismantle and deconstruct within me that were taught to me without me knowing they were being taught to me, how we do that collectively with one another in a place of honesty that creates value and growth, right? Those are, those are very difficult things to do when you don't trust. And I've had many elders and babas tell me, man, we can't move faster than the speed of trust, right? And oftentimes we don't give a great deal of time to that. And we struggle at some point later because we don't trust the people that we're in dialogue with. Or I don't know you deeply. And therefore, I'm always questioning. And when I misspeak, which happens, if the other doesn't trust me, then they don't feel they can say, you know, Hector, when you said that, this is what I heard. Is that what you meant to say? And then I get a chance to say, no, I mean, you heard it right. How did it land on you that how is it that I have to learn to reshare? Or sometimes like, well, that's not what, what I thought I was saying. And then we get in a conversation to correct, to amend, and to grow together in understanding. And so I oftentimes think that, you know, my grandfather would say, De, de lengua me como cien tacos. I, I personally like uh, tacos made from tongue. Um, and he would say that I can eat many of those, but they don't create an action and they don't create a movement. And so what is it that we do besides talking that allows us to build relationships? And some of the things that I do is that I see, sit in deep circle with people that are both similar to me and not similar to me. People with different life experiences where we don't share work strategies, we share who we are, who I am today versus who I was yesterday or who I may be tomorrow. I sit in the here and now, breathing together, sharing with one another with the, with the intent of growing together so then we can do deep work together. And those are elements that we oftentimes don't learn in professional circles because we come together for strategic planning. We come together for uh, big goal setting. We come together to address systemic issues and problems as we see them today without knowing who's in the room. So would you know that the greatest joy that I felt today was the text that I received on the family thread saying that my mother received her second vaccination today. That was the most joyful thing that I experienced all week because the person I love and care for so deeply, we feel has just another protective factor given the, the context that we live in today, right? So if we were sitting in Circulo, I might learn from you, something that brought you great joy or a blessing, right? And you might also realize that I carry a struggle, you know? A son who just left was fortunate enough to move into a dorm uh, as a freshman in college, his first time living away from us. And the struggle is, 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 is he invoking his ancestors when he makes decisions that are important to him, right? The things that we taught him to do, now I have to trust that he's going to activate those when he's by himself. So if you knew me completely, you would know that, man, what an incredible blessing to have your mother have a, a layer of protection during a pandemic that didn't exist months ago. And I'm so grateful for that. And then I have a son who's 18 years old, finding his way in life, trying to figure out who he's going to be, and hoping that he makes a 
those directs, the, the, those good decisions. Both of those things make up who I am today. Today, here, you know, as I'm sharing with you, those are the things that I carry. I think that if we were then strategizing about how to deal with systemic things, you would understand aspects of myself that would help inform the intent that I carry. And that's really, really, really important to create a broader family than the family that you were given biologically, a family of friends and relatives that look dissimilar from you so that you can draw upon those things. I remember, you know, those things were things that my father shared with me. You know, he knew how to create trusting relationships. My mother knew how to reinforce and create trusting relationships that allowed us as a family to benefit from not just the benefit of our family, but all those that were around us. And I think that's an important part when we talk about dismantling racism. Racism is to create separation. White supremacy is to create separation amongst people. And the way we combat it is to actively fight against that separation and call it out when it's presented to us, but at the same time, create deeper connections with one another so that we learn that by achieving the goals we all of dismantling racism and dismantling and, and taking away the hierarchy that comes with that, that by doing that, that we all benefit in some deep way so that we don't distrust one another. That says, when Hector walks through that door where he gets what he wants, is he going to shut the door once he walks through? Or am I going to make sure that I either keep my foot in the door or I prop it open or I take the door down so that all my brothers and sisters can walk in and contribute in that new space? And the only way you know that is if you trust me and that I trust you. And that's really an important thing to do. When we sit in Circulo and I'm invited to share the closing uh, parts of it, I oftentimes invite people to one task of homework. It was a task of homework that was given to me that I carry every single day. And it goes something like this, the way it was taught to me. That um, if all the people that were here and heard the words that I said would be able to see the things that I do, but not hear a word I say, what would they see me do that shows you that I love the people that I say that I love. So let me repeat that. If you could see me do the actions that I take, what would you see me do because you couldn't hear, hear what I say? What would you see me do that shows you that I love the people that I say I love? What would you see me do for Sophia, my daughter? that showed her, demonstrated to her that her father cares and loves her? What would you see me do for my son, who's 18 years old, that demonstrates to him through my actions that I love and care for him? What would you see me do with my partner in life, Lucy, that she would recognize that my actions are rooted in love and admiration and respect for her? because you couldn't hear me tell you, you couldn't hear me share with her that I love her. Those words mean nothing without action. And it goes on to demonstrating my love for my mother, my nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters. But because I live in such a beautiful world, it would also be with the babas and the elders that I have the pleasure of sitting with and that I have to develop the muscle to be able to show the love and care that I have for them and the relationships that we carry. It is a challenge that I embrace. 
it is a something that I have learned that makes me better at who I want to be when I think about that. Many years ago, when I worked in research and evaluation at UC San Francisco, we were doing a site visit in a program where they invited the men to sit in circulo with one another. And they did. These men from the community came together to sit in circle with one another. And in the evaluation program, we were meeting with them, with the partners and spouses of those men, not with the men. And we asked them whether this intervention was of any benefit. And all the women collectively in that circle said, absolutely, that is really where the men should be. We get great value. We, we love it that they're there. And the other evaluation kept, evaluator kept asking, well, what do they do? And the women would say, we don't know what they do. And I know what they do in that circle. They share and grow together. So then finally, she, I, said, uh, I said, what did he do? And the woman said, he came home and he washed the dishes. And I said, what was the significance of that? And she said, and I've known and lived with him for 17 years. And in those 17 years, he had never, ever done that. And he went to the círculo and he came back. And that evening, he did the dishes that were in the sink. And I asked her, I said, do you know, did they tell him to do it? I knew what the action was, where it came from. And she says, I don't know. I don't care. I recognized what he did. So that's the real goal. What does Hector do that others will recognize? As a gesture is great, as never doing dishes in your home in the work that I do. I wanna acknowledge all of you who were sat patiently here. This is not the way we normally do these presentations and work. My hope is that my intent of being both understanding, loving and caring came through in this conversation. My hope is that you get a seed to germinate something that you can do to the people that are around you, both personally and professionally, to show them that you appreciate and love that relationship and that you give life to this goal of dismantling the concept of a false hierarchy of human value and create relationships that are deep, loving, and give us the opportunity to grow and be better. And that we inherit to our children more blessings and less traumas so that they can live the lives that they wish to lead. And that they know that everywhere they go, they are loved and cared for by the people that are responsible for their care and well-being. I want to acknowledge my mother, Selena, today, who brought me great joy just by lending her arm and getting vaccinated. I'm very, very happy and content with that. I want to thank all of you that were here today, uh, Mije and Carolina, who were really helpful in guiding and prepping today. And my hope is that today we accomplish the, what we were hoping to accomplish in today's presentation. I think we're supposed to be ending in about a minute, right? So I'll turn it over yeah, to you, Carolina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Hector, for leading us in that uh, reflection process, um, especially um, in this moment in time um, when we are dealing with so many different personal and professional crises. I think um, you did such a really um, beautiful job of describing the parallel process at all of these levels that um, can bring us closer together and bring the love into our work um, that is so essential in this moment. The chat box um, is blowing up right, right now with, with gratitude towards you um, and toward the space. So just want to say, you know, as the vessel for that, thank you so much. Um, beautifully said. Um, and, you know, for all of the attendees um, in this workshop, um, you can also express your thoughts and reflections about this workshop in the evaluation as well. So you can scroll down um, on the interface and click on rate this session, um, and that'll give you the, another opportunity to um, share your thoughts and feelings about this workshop.
So um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you all yeah. so much. Oh, and you know what? One last reminder, you can navigate to um, the agenda on your left-hand sidebar and attend the um, data office hours. Um, that seems to be a really big theme of the plenary and also our closing. Um, and you can go there and um, learn from a couple of um, data experts at UCLA in the CHIS program um, about how you can use data in your work as well. So um, thank you all so much. Thank you. And I think um, maybe the CPEN staff will just hang on for just one moment. And Hector, you're welcome to stay on as well. Um, if you I'll do a brief, like a, a very minor goodbye. brief. Yeah. I can't see the chat box. So I'm just like, I'm just miss. I feel like I'm missing out on the actions. Of the chat. Box. Oh yes, as the tech slide advancer in the Zoom, um, I for I keep forgetting you're missing what's happening in the chat sure. box. Um, the yeah, people. Yeah, folks are just saying, you know, thank you. Um, so wonderful and informative. Um, Kiona said, thank you, Hector. I really needed to hear it, all of this today. Tiffany said, so much gratitude. Thank you for your energy. Um, Mona said, thank you so much. This session truly moved me and reminded me what's important in life and to continuously move in love. Mm. Thank you for all making this happen. Mm. Um, oh. Mira um, shared beautifully said. Uh, I'll be checking in with Lauren. I hope everything is good with Lauren because I, you know, just that was the only thing that was um, struck, reminding me, like, I hope everything is good with her right now. That's, that was it. Uh, but how's the rest of the convening uh, going for you, for, for CPEN? Oh, oh we still have good, people going. Good, good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, looks like folks are still making their way to um, the office hours. Um, but yeah, the rest of the conference is, is going really well. Um, this morning, um, I think I mentioned to you that we had um, Dr. Nino's Pons yes. um, really talk about data in, um, I thought a very valuable way. I don't know, Mihe, I haven't had the chance to check in with Mihe and Stephanie about it, but um, like I could really see the advocacy work in how she was thinking about the data mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of questioning the fundamentals around, you know, what we measure, how we measure it. Um, do those measures really capture um, yeah. the suffering and the pain that people are experiencing? Um, so. Yeah, cool. and I think, you know, I just hope Lauren also similarly, I hope Lauren is okay and everything's okay yeah. and, you know, yeah. No, we're we're here. We're flexible, and you know, um, yeah. no um, no challenges yeah. on our end. Well, the 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 data side of things, right? Um, I I always feel like the, our goal should be to create journals that are created by people of color that uses the data that we want to collect about our communities, and not have to use you know the the historic lit reviews that acknowledge all the deficit thinking that went on to, to, to describe my family, right? All the things that, you know, that, that existed within my family reviewed as deficits and things to be researched 
to understand, you know, how is it that we get that out of them, right? And, uh, you know, but I think we're on the cusp, you know, like in that, that keynote address that begins to speak about the, um, and that data cuts with two sides, right? I mean, and how is it that we, we do that? Wow, so, yeah, I'll, have to, I'll have to find out what she's written uh, in order to, to uh, learn a little bit from her perspective. Yeah. 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 Um, actually, I don't know um, if um, this has already been discussed with you, Hector, but um, we are um, part of, we're one of many in the broader California Reducing Disparities Project, the community mm -hmm. um, that is CRDP. And a lot of these same questions, as I'm sure um, in your work with the um, Circulos come up about um, the evaluation piece and um, mm -hmm. in particular, you know, evaluation in, in mental health. And we're actually, we're kind of trying to figure all that stuff out too. And, sure. um, you know, yeah, so well, I'd love to. Well, we have, we, we have um, uh, Dr. Eriberto Scamilla who oversees our evaluation and, um, you know, internal learning process of what we do. And if you need to connect with him or myself or anybody at NCN to think about why we choose to measure the things that we choose to measure, right? Um, and hopefully they'll hopefully illuminate concepts or reinforce thinking that you already have, right? Um, because, uh, you know, we, we try to measure things that we think are important to our work. And so, interconnection, um, understanding whether you see yourself reflected in the content that was shared, right? Did you learn something new? And, and, the, and, and for us, the ultimate, the ultimate outcome for us is when people say, you, this presentation or this conversation or this training reminded me of things that my grandmother and parents were always telling me, right? And so then, then what basically we say is, then we didn't teach you anything. We've just given you the ability to apply it in a new place, right? And and um, so you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, when you're trying to reduce disparities, there's a whole host of modalities that you're trying to address. You know, physical health, mental health, um, you know, socio socioeconomic well-being, right? Um, all the disparities that we want to do, but what is it that we're trying to do that is similar across all groups? That gives us a desired outcome. So yeah, no, uh, you know, reach out, reach out. Aquí estamos para servir. We're here to serve. All right. So your reflections okay. on how this yeah. went, um, given the the last minute adjustment where I had to speak twice as much as I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> well, I see Mihai's mouth opened, so I I don't want to I want to recognize that. <laughs> Yeah. I felt like it was amazing. I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, Hector, you uh, presented two years ago at our conference. I don't know if you remember that. Um, yes, yes. And it was um, like, it was really evaluated. It was like the, the most favorite, you know, people loved it. And I think there's some partners there, like Courage, folks from Courage was there. Yeah. I actually wasn't able to be at the conference at all. So I, myself and Sa'ili, my other staff, uh, you know, and you, we worked on it together. And so mm -hmm. bringing you back and having you, you know, with us at this conference just makes me, me feel like it's, I'm, you know, I'm so grateful that, um, mm -hmm. you know, that you are here with us. And, you know, I think mm -hmm. that is, was like amazing and, you know, I hope everything is okay with Lauren and I'm so grateful that, you know, mm -hmm. you were willing to, you know, uh, share even more offerings. Um, and I was just like, this is great. This is like, I feel so resourced, you know, and mm -hmm. just having you, you know, be with us was really amazing. Sure. Yeah. Oh. Well, how about you, Carolina? Did you, and I Stephanie too, because Stephanie's been very quiet. I feel the hi, same can, way. Um, hi, can folks hear oh, me? Go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, yes, Stephanie. Oh. Yes. Hi, Hector. I know yeah. I was so busy on the chat and making sure that everybody 
caught a glimpse of the the quotes that you were dropping and the messages that you were just sharing, but I wanted to just extend my gratitude for you. I think you you did such a phenomenal job. And I'm very grateful that you were able to be here today and that it aligned with you and it aligned with us in the conference. So I'm in I'm in such a place of deep gratitude for for mm -hmm. all the messages that you shared and what really resonated with me is leaning into love and showing up with love and I think that's been a big theme and a lot of I, I've just been seeing that and reading about that a lot so mm -hmm. being in this conference today and specifically in this workshop and hearing you talk about it I was just sitting here and saying wow this is this is really a message to my life right now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And really excited for you to come back again one day. <laughs> when it's appropriate. How about you, Carolina? Your reflection on, on the workshop? <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know, second, you know, all the sentiments and um, feelings from others, um, I think, you know, one one thing I've been reflecting a lot about is, um, that I think you spoke to um, very beautifully is, um, you know, how how are we going to shift away from the um, the deficit focus? Um, because even in our work at CPEN, um, you know, we do often lead with a discussion around like disparities and. Yeah. Um, it, the, the moment in time feels like, you know, we really need to, to sort of honor the legacy and the work of, of that and, um, and the work that people have done on, you know, these really important issues around cultural competence, but also at the same time, like, how do we really shift more towards the internal healing and resilience that yeah. is within all of us to move forward? Um, so that we're not just sort of stuck in our own personal and professional and kind of macro trauma. And so I think, you know, yeah. you really spoke to kind of the resilience piece within all of us and what it took for so many of our families to come here. Um, how do we kind of bring that and carry that forward and recognize that so we can um, really start to heal? Yeah. So Carolina, I, I wanna say that it's easy for us to say we're going to dismantle this and go to asset only based stuff, but our policy structure and our the resources that come from policies are all based on that deficit model. So we're at a critical moment where we have to, before we make that final shift, um, we have to introduce the assets, right? That, in, that we're not just preventing things, right? We're just not preventing things. We should be, promoting something, right? Something that lives longer than me, right? And so, you know, I think, especially for younger professionals that we can become very discouraged. We can like, oh, what, am I just perpetuating it by doing this? I think you have a, a crucial role of being um, the bridge builders of doing this. And that we talk about as, as we move forward, that every presentation we do that has to highlight the deficits in order to change the policy, in order to get the resources, that we augment that with the opportunities that come from building assets, right? And um, and that's a that's a muscle that they don't teach yet in graduate schools, right? They don't they don't teach that, right? And so we have to do that, right? As as a, as as a way of of establishing that movement and progress. And that if we do that, eventually, my, my belief is that eventually people was like, don't tell us about the disparities. Uh, tell us about the opportunities that we have to address those. And what do we build from, right? Because, um, you know, the, the, uh, we once supported, a years and years ago, supported a project in Santa Cruz, probably like 17, 18 years ago. That project was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It was a three-year funding cycle. And they did circulos and platicas conversations amongst parents from the community. And, and they were trained on how to have those conversations and they did those conversations. And when the grant cycle ended, the county then said, oh, this has to end uh, because the grant cycle is over, right? There's no more resources. And then the community said, all right, but we're still gonna meet, right? And, and they're like, no, no, 
you can't meet because there's no funding for you to meet. And the, the community's like, we don't care. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. So the grant was closed. The county stepped away. And the families continued to meet. And that at some point in the next, the next six months, the county caught wind that they were still doing this. But they had no funding for it. And so then the county is like, well, we need to find resources to support this, right? And there were people like, why do we need to find resources to support this if they're doing this, right? When they did find resources, they went back to the community like, we now have resources to do this. And, and I think they should have been really transparent is that we need to give you a little bit of resources so we can claim credit for what we're doing, right? And, uh, and so years later, when we were negotiating with another high level administrator, and somebody says, well, what are the outcomes of the interventions that NCN has? And she said, so I witnessed the outcome. I witnessed a community taking ownership of their journey of support. And I witnessed the county struggling to find a way to take credit for what they were doing by themselves, right? And so those are the things that I think that, you know, I don't think are unique to Santa Cruz County at that time. Uh, but I'm sure happens in all these, in many other communities when things work well for communities. So Carolina, I'll let you guys go because you probably have to go to other parts of your conference, right? But I will invite you that as you sit and reflect a little bit about what it was, if there's anything that you heard from me that didn't sound like it was something that I intended to say, the only way I can correct it is if somebody shares it back with me. You know, Hector, when I heard you say this, or when you say this, or this concept or idea hits me in this way, uh, that's the only way I'm going to grow. So I, I, I welcome and grateful for all the positive things that you shared. But if at some point later you're reflecting, you say, you know what, I need to share this more critical comment with Hector. I, I, I welcome it. I, it's, it gives me the opportunity to grow. So, uh, you know, I'll let you get to your day. I'll let you get to the rest of your convening. I hope the rest of the conference goes well. Hope you guys get incredible reviews so that the funder says, well, we need to keep funding it. All right. Thank you so much, Hector. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm going to leave you guys. Yeah, thank to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Take care.